I'm I'm Jodok. I'm it's my hometown in Austria. Um, yeah, coming coming here from uh, we have our office in Berlin and in Austria, and I'm uh, happy happy to be here. So um, yeah, you might ask uh, why is this guy here from Austria telling us about scaling scaling stuff? And the story is uh, I plan to be here uh, already in 2011. But I had like a minor accident and had a concussion. Uh, horses and cows were involved. Uh, long story. Uh, but at this time, I was in Berlin. Uh, I've been CTO of StudiVZ, which is like the um, German or was the German social network that was like. While nowadays Facebook took over, but at this time we were like the biggest German-speaking uh, website with a uh, few million of users. Now I'm working on a distributed data store. It's named Create. And today I'm telling you a little bit about my experiences uh, in the area of Internet of Things and also uh, what I think is, is important if you deal with this kind of workload. So a real-world example, probably a little bit like a case study. Um, as a German company named uh, Gigaset, uh, it's a Siemens-affiliated company, and they're making a, like a home automation or connected home system. Uh, sensors in your home, your window, uh, on your door, some actors where you can turn on a siren, probably you have intrusion detection, water in the basement, all that stuff, smoke detectors. And these things are connected to a base station, probably your router, and then uh, later on they're going to send events, events to the cloud, to the backend system, all the time. Users, end users, they have their mobile applications, mobile phones, uh, where they can check the status of their home, or where they can look at the curve of the temperature in their, in their basement, or things like that. So I think that's just something pretty easy to understand, uh, the, the patterns you need there. Uh, and it's, of course, this is not like the only Internet of Things applications. There are much more, much more of them. So what they have in common is like high concurrency, because like the sensors, if they detect something, they're going to send a request immediately. Um, we have a lot of, lots of requests. Uh, they're sending uh, requests all the time. Uh, you do not want to queue them, and including lo long polling. So one challenge is definitely all these long polling requests because most of these devices are nutted uh, and they cannot, you cannot contact them. So if you want to have an actor where you put the switch on or off, you always have like a long polling connection to your server uh, where basically every user has typically more than one or two, two sessions. And um, I personally don't like a system where you just add uh, the stuff to the queue and then somehow uh, move it there. Most of the stuff has to, has to happen in, in real time. Because if you have like an intrusion alert or you want to switch on something with your iOS, iOS app, it needs to happen, happen immedi immediately. And of course you have lots of requests. Basically every request, everything that is happening is generating a request. The other thing is like semi-structured data. You, uh, we ended up uh, defining, trying to define a schema for the data, but it turns out that this is very hard because you have a firmware upgrade of a sensor. And if you upgrade the sensor, you might have additional fields uh, that, are, uh, that are there. It's not very easy to, some sensors can't be updated and need to be supported for a, for a, longer, uh, for a, longer, for a longer time. And uh, you also uh, don't know exactly what happened. So if you like end up defining tables per sensor or whatever in a database, this is, this is like, like pretty hard. So probably a document uh, oriented approach. And the other uh, challenge uh, is this read write workload. Um, you might think like such an application is just generating write uh, and just a little bit of, of, of read because like the sensors are sending events all the time and now and then the, uh, the user is taking out his iPhone and wants to see what's happening. But in fact, all of the writes, uh, like uh, every event is usually triggering one or multiple reads. 
because you don't know whether this is now an alarm or you need to trigger a notification. So let's say in one house you receive an event that the window has been opened. You need to look up the preferences of that user, whether that user wants to be informed if this, this uh, window is being opened or being, uh, being closed. So the read-write workload uh, is, is something where you, you need like uh, read and writes all, at, all the time. And of course, the real-time aspect. I mentioned it already, like uh, user, you probably have data-intensive queries that uh, are, cannot take a long time. So using Hadoop is like slightly different. If you opening up your app and you want to see the temperature curve of your house over the last half year, you cannot trigger a Hadoop job that is picking up the data and then uh, just uh, coming back half an hour later or 10 minutes later and, and, and doing, doing, the, doing the result. So, um, and the last thing is uh, time series data. You end up generating more and more and more and more data. It's just growing data. It's uh, usually associated with a timestamp and it's, uh, it's growing. So just the area uh, what I want to cover, what do I mean with uh, Internet of Things application? So some, some ideas how to, how to solve it. And uh, was, was, was like usually, usually pretty hard. What we tried was MySQL. And we've been running pretty, pretty large MySQL installations uh, there at our social network. We had uh, about 1,000 servers, 150 of them were MySQL servers. Uh, we had a setup uh, where we had uh, not just uh, master and read slaves, but where we also had multi-masters, so we could write to multiple masters, and the data was sharded uh, as well. So it's like kind of the, the full-blown uh, madness you can do with MySQL, sharded multi-master uh, database, and this was like, uh, was, was, was pretty hard with the backup, with the relations, with uh, schema migrations and stuff, stuff like that. So I think uh, MySQL is really, uh, really good, but to scale it, it's hard. You need specialists, you need to really know what you're doing, and uh, probably not every developer uh, wants to do this and, uh, and has, that, uh, has that knowledge. Similar thing applies uh, to Postgres. I think it's just a great database, but a high availability setup, uh, load balancing, backup point in time recovery, making sure you have all the wall files backed up, and uh, that is not, not that easy. Also, if you have a lot of database connections uh, that, you, that you manage your memory consumption correctly, warming up a database, and of course the full text, full text search is not, not really, really good. Uh, what some people do is just buy the, buy the expensive stuff. Uh, think, uh, I hope it's okay for some sponsors. <laughs> uh, but I, I think uh, I've seen these machines screaming. It's like you can really buy high performance there. There are also some scale-out approaches. But for example, we were using uh, quite some net apps at that time, and we were also using um, HP, HDS uh, storage systems. And if you really have random workload, in this case it was more like small finds blobs, where we had to serve at yeah, up to 80,000 requests per second, uh, it's always uh, I.O. bound. It's, uh, it's not possible to, to do something like this with a, with a, normal, with a normal system on a, on a single node, or you need a scale-out approach. So distributed is definitely, definitely important. And, um, and at some point, you need to, you need to upgrade these, uh, these things. You have a firmware upgrade. Uh, you probably want to try other stuff. Swift, Ceph, Rados, S3. But the distributed file system, I think, is still something that is, uh, that is pretty, pretty hard to achieve. So I think the way to go, or at least what I'm, what I'm standing for, what I have seen working best, is to go with the distributed system, uh, try to use I.O. of all machines available, not just concentrate the I.O. on a set of machines, but just use every spindle you can get to, to utilize and therefore use a share nothing architecture. That means that you don't have any center components, master slave uh, repli repli replication. So, and use commodity hardware, because if you 
build a share nothing architecture, if one node fails, this doesn't matter. Like we started using SSDs and we started putting in uh, consumer grade SSDs because they are so much cheaper than server grade SSDs, but uh, no RAID, nothing, uh, but if, it, if a disk fails, you just, you just throw, it, uh, throw, it, throw it away. So I'm talking in this area, distributed, open source, and uh, commodity hardware. So the, the next thing was like, okay, let's do it with something in the, in the Hadoop space. Use, use that, it's real, really a lot of things going on there, and um, how, 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 should you, how, how could you do that? How could you do that? So the, the case was why I think uh, Hadoop is not really appropriate for, the, for this area, Internet of Things, or at least it's okay for some, some cases, probably analytics, uh, but, but not for the, for the real, real stuff, is we're building a system for, uh, for a company that is doing social media analytics, and these guys uh, were, were collecting tweets. So uh, tweets and Facebook likes and other social media data, about 100 million records per day, and total they had about 20, million, 20 billion records, records collected. And the tweet is for me very similar to a sensor record. So if you re receive something in the area, uh, Internet of Things, what we have seen, eye beacon stuff or sensors, it's pretty similar to a, to a tweet. You have a, you have a pretty complicated JSON object where you have uh, origin, where you have measurements, where you have all kind of, kind of things. So the, Hadoop, the hoops, Hadoop stuff was like yeah, building up a rather huge uh, Hadoop, Hadoop installation, trying with Hive. But um, at, at the end of the day, we ended up having an architecture that worked with a system where we were storing, like collecting the crawled files on S3, then uh, loading it into Hadoop, uh, creating indexing, index them in Elasticsearch, and some results in, in Memcache, had an Nginx with Lua in front of it, and some Jenkins jobs uh, that were maintaining all, all the technology and salt that was deploying, was deploying that stuff. So uh, the bill uh, was not uh, really cheap, like 120 instances on, uh, on EC2, but the system was like working, working pretty well. So if you indexed uh, and, and did, the, did the runs where we did all the permutations, we had to calculate network uh, was just like a lot of network utilization, and also it turned out that the disk I.O., we were really able to utilize the, the disk I.O. of all these machines, like uh, 900 EBS volumes, about 600,000 uh, IOPS per second. But uh, the thing is like, um, it is like babysitting a zoo of technologies. And that was, that was cute, client paid us for it, but it's, it's not really sustainable. Just think of that small tiny gorilla growing up, uh, that small tiny tiger growing up, and um, yeah, that's, so far, this was like the only way, the way we could do. There are some other, other ideas you could use. Uh, some people would say use, use MongoDB. That's probably not, uh, not me uh, that they're gonna recommend this. Um, and, oh, sorry. Um, I think that the schema-less database is an is an, over, an overreaction. And that uh, schemas really have, uh, have some, some values. I really believe in the, in the SQL approach. Not of all the things uh, like like relations, and this is also taken from Nathan Martz. I think you you know this guy. He was um, at uh, at Twitter, and he was uh, was part of the authors of the Storm uh, Storm project. Uh, project, and uh, we we came to the conclusion that we wanted to have something that is a little bit like Elasticsearch because this was the only component in that infrastructure that worked really really well but uh, use it as a data store. Have it as primary store, have only one system that basically behaves like Elasticsearch uh, and it's that easy to scale, but with database characteristics. And there are some guys out there uh, who tried it, who have been writing, uh, writing about it. You find threads on Quora, uh, there's a company uh, working on this Elasticsearch uh, things, but obviously there are some, something missing, some things missing. missing. And uh, about two years ago, 
We just started like we were running a company in Europe similar to, to uh, Omni, what the Omni TI guys are doing here, service business, consulting for, for high scale applications. We have shown some of the examples. And out of this, uh, we, we basically created uh, create, uh, Elastic Data Store uh, I'm, I'm, I'm also talking about. So the components is like all the nodes are the same. It's think of SQL on top of Elasticsearch. That's probably easiest to explain if you if you're familiar with it. But there are quite some quite some changes in there. So one node has like is exposing a SQL interface where a parser is taking the SQL query, then translating it like a normal database into an execution plan that is then being executed in the cluster. Uh, you can also store blobs in there uh, that are stored on the file system, and all the nodes, uh, all the nodes are the same. So this discover each other via multicast, or you can configure unicast if you if you really if you want if you uh, if you want to. And um, inside inside uh, there, there is a transport protocol where all the nodes are talking with each other. So you ask any node a question, a query. And then it's being sent to the other nodes if he is not if he is not responsible if he's not responsible for 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 that. The components there, just to uh, to, to to show you this 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 briefly, is um, like there is. Let's start from the bottom. In this technology stack is Lucene, and Lucene is you often think about Lucene that is just a, a search engine, but Lucene the library itself. It's more a database style thing. It has a, a, a trans log where, where commits are being written. These uh, commits are then being persisted to the, to the data store. You can easily also use this for replication because uh, data is only appended and it's not like modified all over and over. So it has really uh, great advantage, advantages to use it also as database, like uh, commit points or, or things, like, things like that. And additional to that, uh, as I said, the blob storage, where we basically put the SHA-256 SHA, uh, uh, hash of a, of a file and uh, place it in a subdirectory structure where all the blobs are being, being stored. And uh, on top of that is the entire network cluster. So this is built around Netty. I think you might be familiar with Netty. Netty is like evented I.O. Uh, networking library that is, uh, in my opinion, really fast, really reliable. It's non-blocking evented I.O. and it allows you to build modern Java application. With modern, I mean not in the sense of enterprise Java beans and uh, whatever adapters. It's really, sometimes it even feels a little bit Pythonic uh, that, that, you, uh, that you have yeah, modern, modern, uh, modern, modern Java. And on top of this is this, uh, this, distributed, this distributed query engine. Uh, we are using also parts from Facebook Presto, so Facebook Presto SQL parser that is being extended for, for write support, and then you have an admin, admin UI and a command line shell, the crash, and uh, client libraries. Um, I, I just like to show you uh, a demo. So we, we just built like our demo cluster where the developers can play around. It's uh, built on these Intel NAC uh, boards. These are like uh, that size uh, computers. Intel i5 processor has about 16 gigs of RAM and uh, SSD disk, 120 gig SSD disk. So we have now 12 of those machines and three cubes. And uh, it's pretty easy possible to process about 1 billion records with these machines and, try and see how they fail over, how they create replicas, uh, and like, uh, like that. Of course, uh, you know, you can, it, you can install it uh, also on cloud or on-premise. So we have this little cluster online. Uh, unfortunately, the, 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 I, I can try, but last time I tried, the speed of the network was not like uh, very, very good. So this is the, like the live view in our uh, office. Uh, office there, we have a live cam connected to, to them. So you can see what they're doing. It's also like if you open up play, play.create.io, uh, you should see the live stream of, uh, of, what, of what's happening there. But as I said, uh, I have prepared also a backup video as, 
the bandwidth it was just too too slow before, so we skipped that. Um, I'll show it show it to you that way. So in this cluster, uh, you basically yeah you have your machine that you that you connect, and uh, we have uh, we have an installer there like you run a command line installer where you just download the tarball, so it's not a set of daemons you need to install. Um, there you, then you install this daemon, and after the daemon is started, it's opening up uh, automatically the admin UI, where you see the, cl the cluster there. And if you add nodes uh, to, to that cluster, it's, uh, it's automatically discovering those, uh, those nodes, and you can just easily use command line, uh, use SQL to, to control it. And if you destroy or if you disconnect one of the cluster, one of the nodes, it's, it's turning to, to, to yellow and starts like self-healing, like uh, replicating, uh, creating the replicas that are missing and uh, yeah, utilizing network bandwidth to, 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 to do so. And um, yeah, after that, the, the health is, is good. So it's, it's like um, building, uh, we, we build it in a way that uh, S3, for example, is one of the design goals. Have something like S3, but be able to install this on your own machines and not uh, necessarily uh, administer all the zoo of technologies I mentioned, uh, I mentioned before, like a Hadoop cluster with uh, name nodes, secondary name nodes, task tracker, job trackers, uh, hive, uh, hive nodes, and, uh, and, and things, like, things like that. So, so that application, that application there uh, that we that we built is now running on a, on an environment uh, where we're using nginx as a front end that is doing SSL termination for all the base stations where we uh, where we have these long polling connections that also receive that receive the that receive actor information or that is sending the sending the heartbeats of the sensor sensors. It's an HA proxy uh, on, on all these machines that is connecting these uh, front-end machines to a, to a storm cluster. And the Django application is available for the iOS applications where we don't have that, man, that much traffic that do the, do the queries. And then on the storm cluster, we created it in a way that we just installed storm and uh, create on, on, on the same machine and it's connecting to localhost. So Storm is always just connecting to localhost, and if you need more capacity in that cluster, you just add nodes uh, where you have Storm installed and, um, and, 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 a, and a create node. And uh, therefore, it's, um, it's very, very easy, very easy to, to, uh, to scale. So when it comes to, to storing and um, handling data that is um, for time series or for Internet of Things, Sharding and partitioning, I think, is something uh, that a lot of uh, databases are, are, are probably missing. So our take is that we do sharding by default. You can tune the sharding, like you can specify what is the routing key you want to use for sharding. You can also use compound keys for, 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 for sharding. This is usually that's helpful to also have much bigger performance if you, if you do queries and partition data. So the standard SQL dialect uh, is, is also provides capabilities for that. So you just say partition by, and then you specify a criteria. You can also use uh, things like uh, if you have a timestamp that is in milliseconds, you use a scalar function like day trunk, for example, that is creating a day, and then per day you create a partition. That means now you have, let's say you're uh, storing 100 million records per day. You want to create a new set of shards per day. Uh, it's just one, one command where you, create, uh, where you create this table. The other stuff is like uh, we, we added was like full text search because we found that all of the stuff that is user facing at the end of the day needs full text search. So, uh, we, we wanted to avoid that you need to add an additional search engine that is capable of the basic full text things like if you exchange two letters or if you do a search or if you have upper lowercase, if you have similarity, 
things like things like that. So as I said, the power of Elasticsearch and having that available um, is, is something something uh, that is that is really important. Same comes for geospatial stuff. So uh, Lucene also has a lot of uh, support for geospatial, rectangular, or boundary search. That's that's also part of that uh, of that search thing. Another thing uh, where we found where we had problems, especially with MongoDB or uh, React, when you are when you are using a React, if you want to do uh, aggregations where you do distinct counts over over different different uh, different data set, that this is becoming pretty expensive, and that you uh, end up um, end up using resources or making the the system system really slow. So uh, what I think is, is a pretty cool thing is um, we have the possibility of something like real-time map reduce. So a request that we're processing, let's say, has th the possibility of three categories. The one is a simple get. That is very easy. You want to get one record. And uh, if, you, if you set it up perfectly, you know the routing key, you go directly to one shard and you receive that one record. That's like the fastest operation possible. The second fastest or second complex uh, operation is like if you do a, a query where multiple records are being uh, part of that query. So uh, you issue that query, you say select all the persons living in Boston, then uh, this query is being distributed to all the shards. The shards uh, give, get, give back their result. It's being merged, returned to the client. But the aggregations are slightly difficult because you need like that map reduce step. Uh, if you want to say you want to count uh, all, uh, uh, you, wa you want to count the last names, the unique last names of the people living in cities. You, you need a two-step approach where in the first step you're basically collecting the data that is uh, uh, needed for that query, and in the second step you need to reshuffle it in the cluster to do a distributed uh, count or sum. And this works really well with, uh, with that, uh, that kind uh, done in Lucene because it's internally using these doc values. And doc values is a representation of the, of the record or parts of the record. So think of, of a string that can be divided in, uh, in, in, in parts, in word stems, or in number letter combinations. So you have integer representation of, of, your, of your data. And this is like a pointer to the data, but the, the translation of these pointers is the same for the entire cluster. So you only need to send around for this uh, aggregation the integers uh, for that representation, and that uh, avoids object creation and garbage collection and that stuff in Java. So this, this allows like doing an aggregate, aggregate count on a, on a record set, let's say 50 million records uh, where you have to, where you want to do distinct counts just in milliseconds, because all of this happens uh, evented, non-blocking uh, over, uh, over, this, over, this, over this, netty, this netty layer. So um, we see that aggregations is something a lot of, of people use. The other thing is, of course, transactions are, or not of course, but transactions are missing, and there are some things you, uh, you need to pay for if you want such an eventual consistent system. The thing about updates is like optimistic currency control. We often found out that concurrent processes try to modify the same data. So uh, what we're using is like a version number where you can, um, where you have every record versioned and you recognize if you have a, if you have a conflict. So uh, then you, you receive a conflict, you can retry. But the smart thing is like if you have uh, an object column, so we support the object column where you can store JSON. If just two processes are modifying one property of this JSON, this can be merged. So it's possible that like two processes are modifying the same record set at the same time, and there are quite some, some things there uh, where, you, where you need this if multiple sensors are sending your, are sending your, your data. And um, I'd call this, Compute capabilities or analytics capabilities. So very often you want to have scalar functions or user-defined functions on, on your data. And you want them to be distributed, executed, distributed. So let's say uh, in this case uh, you want to count by day and the day is like different. A day is different all over the world. Like uh, time zones difference or uh, the, uh, January has more days than February. And so this is just one example 
uh, if you want to count all, day, all events that happened on that day in Moscow, then you need to do this, you move this logic to the node. So this needs to happen uh, on the cluster if you have 30 nodes or something like that. All the nodes need to calculate this and not at the end of the result. And um, there, you can, there, there you can plug in such functionality that is being executed on the, on the date. I think that's something that's also a criteria uh, if, you, if you select your, 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 your data store for, for what you're doing. And as I said before, it's also the, the, the blobs. You always, or at least what I have seen, you always still have some blobs lying around. So even if you think of uh, IoT application uh, where you probably don't deal uh, with blobs, uh, at the end of the day, you're going to have some, some blobs, a screenshot of a user or at least uh, a few million blobs are always there. And um, we've been using a lot of different file systems, but at the end of the day, you really want to store it just in the database and you don't want it to bloat your database. You don't want to uh, kill it your caches and you don't want to use in, make it using up uh, system resources. So as I said, we have a very simple mechanism where you just store it under the SHA, uh, SHA-1 hash of, your, uh, of, the, of the content and then it's being stored in the cluster and can be delivered. And this without uh, using the caches, of course, file system caches being utilized, but not like the, the heap memory or other caches we're using, and um, that's, that they can be used there. The other thing was, like we found uh, instrumentation of the tools, and I think some of you guys are also DevOps or operation people. Uh, how do you maintain the systems? How you have different admin, admin UIs, you have a lot of different things you, you, can, you can use there, and we found that traditional SQL, it still works best. So if you want to have a Nagios check, or whether you use uh, Sabix or another instrumentation thing, it's very easy to write your SQL query that is uh, creating the result you need and not making a curl, a post with a JSON body, and then receiving some measurement, and then it's changing. So just using SQL for the instrumentation of the system, of the system as well. Of course, uh, sometimes SQL statements get longer or, or complicated, but uh, building, uh, building all that stuff around SQL, I think that's, uh, that's something I, I, I really like. So, um, as I said, uh, we're, an, we're an open source project. We launched about fifth, five months ago. We've been working on this for, for, roughly, for roughly two years. And the funny thing uh, that happened was like, uh, I think one week after we launched, someone posted on Hacker News. We, we didn't know about it. And uh, since that, like, the, the madness, uh, madness started. And uh, we, we see right now about, uh, we have about 1,000 uh, instances, uh, we guess at least, uh, running, about 10,000 uh, 10, downloads. Uh, we're building uh, images for RPM, Depth, uh, Arch Linux, Docker, uh, working on client libraries for Python especially SQL Alchemy integration. We also have a Java client where you can uh, use it with, uh, with JDBC, Ruby, Active Record, PHP, PDO, Node.js, and, uh, and, 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 and Go. So um, the, the thing is, or what, what like my main, my main, uh, main takeaway is like building such systems now for 10 years, 12 years, whatever, is um, I don't mind, oh, what happened? Um, what, what, what I learned is uh, that you, I have a strong preference for open source software. Uh, that you that you that you that you use it. I have a strong preference for distributed systems. Only use distributed systems. Really look uh, where you have like uh, single single points of failures. Don't use a system with a single point of single point of uh, of, of failure. And also make everything that everything can fail. So the only thing I learned about high available systems. Uh, was not whether they failed, just when they, when they failed. So, uh, I mean, Netflix is praying this, uh, a lot of you are praying this, but still for databases, uh, I haven't seen 
uh, the perfect the perfect database that is like uh, working perfectly in a in a distributed distributed world. And we are still at, we're just at the beginning. We are also a very young project. Like other projects are are also out there. But you should definitely should definitely move uh, move in move in that uh, move in that direction. So I'm. Um, Happy to, to receive uh, feedback from you. Also ask, answer some questions you, you, might, uh, you might have um, in, that, uh, in, that, in, in that area. And thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah? Okay, so the question was about changing uh, one record uh, and whether we do record locking. What's that? What's that? So the the answer is like the transaction is transactions are uh, safe on one document. So if you update one document, uh, it's only one process who can write it, and this is like a transaction level on on that document. The document can be written or can't be written. What you can do is, if you, if you receive, it's funny. <laughs> what, what you can do um, is, uh, usually you receive a conflict, and then you can resolve that conflict. You can retry writing it, uh, or increment the version number and write it again, but you can also specify that you want to tolerate that behavior that you're not record locking. So if you, if you want to configure it in a way, <laughs> Okay, it's, it's now really over the presentation. <laughs> it's switching off all the time on, on its own. Um, is that you can configure it to, to not be, uh, be not record locking. Same thing like persistence. You can configure uh, whether you only want to write the primary shards and then the secondary shards are being written delayed or you force that all the shards are being written uh, at the same time. Or you can read only from primary shards by default and uh, can also configure it that you read from secondary shards as well if you have a higher, higher performance. Or you can write it synchronous that it's written on disk or that it's just written to the trans log. So there are a lot of things you can, you can configure uh, on that. But generally speaking, on a record level, it's transactional on a record level. And when reading, it's also that it's a uh, consistent uh, read view. So if you have a query that is running for two seconds, and uh, during these two seconds you're inserting and removing records and all the time, uh, that process is holding uh, a pointer to the commit point uh, where the transaction or the read uh, query was started, and it's consistent for that read no matter what happens after uh, that query has been issued. So there is some guarantee of consistency there. Yeah. Is there, is there an optimization where you can basically like tag a database read only so you don't like basically just take all the There's uh, right now there's uh, no read only uh, lock. It's uh, also no authentication. It's an HTTP endpoint that is uh, available, and over this HTTP endpoint you can do uh, do several things. What we have on our uh, roadmap is uh, access that you have a read-only uh, user. So you have like a um, realm that is uh, read-only and uh, one for write. We're not planning to add roles and, and users, but the, this, the distinction between uh, read and write, that's, uh, that's, that's something we plan. The other thing is uh, point-in-time recovery. So Lucene has a nice feature. Unfortunately, we're not ex uh, exposing it yet, where you can, uh, let's say you drop a table, that the table is, of course, dropped, but you can roll back uh, the, 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 the drop, like a time machine, Apple time machine, where you can turn back the database to how it was one day before, or you even can make queries to how the database was one, one, one day before. But um, yeah, that's, that's not yet there. It might take a few months until we are at this, at this point. Yeah? So the schema migration was a problem before. Uh, how, uh, how strict is the schema now? You said it was a schema back. Yeah, so schemas, um, I, uh, you have a love-hate relationship with schemas because like schemas, they help you to make sure data is, is consistent. So 
I learned that uh, if you can apply a schema, you should apply a schema. What we can do is like we have all the table where we can add columns, that's, that's no problem. Um, changing the type of a column that therefore you need to create a, a new table. So we have a command that is uh, select into or copy from and copy to. So you can basically select from one table and uh, insert into another table if you really need to change the type or, or stuff like that. And this is happening in a distributed way. So you don't have to uh, write everything to one file and then in that insert that file again, but it's happening distributed in the cluster and that, uh, that, works, that works pretty far, fast. By default, all the columns are indexed according to their, to their type. You need to explicitly switch off indexing for one column if you don't uh, want to have it, have it indexed. So uh, the answer is if you, if you change your schema, you, uh, where you need a re-indexing uh, and you can't avoid it, then you, you, you can do it uh, in the cluster uh, it's, uh, itself. But um, yeah, that's the, that's the way we are doing schema migrations. Yeah? Okay, um, I noticed you reference Ceph uh, and some other horizontally scalable uh, software class in uh, earlier in your slides. What type of hardware deployment uh, platform do you recommend as a pair by scale for the So you, you were asking about the hardware uh, environment, hardware deployment platform, if you want to store multiple uh, terabytes uh, there. So. What we learned is, and that's what we, we've often seen as well, is uh, that people probably, let's say, start with uh, Amazon, Amazon Web Services, they use the, the tools there. I think it's fine as long as you use a standard Linux machine and you try not to be locked in on that platform. But as you grow, this is becoming uh, more expensive, unless you are at scale for Netflix or whatever, where you probably get even better prices. But what we learned is it's, it's quite pricey. And often for data intense applications where you really store, where you want to have SSDs, where you want to have stuff like that, you might end up running on premise or running uh, yeah, the providers that have actual, actual hardware. So my preference is if I build something that scale, I'm gonna use something like bare metal machines and uh, run probably Docker on it or uh, that's depending on how edgy you are. So if I would build something now, I would build it on, uh, on Docker and I would, uh, would build it up on, on, bare, on, on, on bare, bare metal. Uh, but uh, if I need to just see how it's going, I would start with probably Google Compute Engine recently also made a lot of improvements, um, soft layer, all the, all, the, all, the, all the cloud providers. But as soon as you know like how, how your application is going to, to evolve. So the example I showed before where we had these 120 nodes uh, on Amazon uh, running that application, so the client, still didn't know his business model and he was just trying out all of the stuff with this social media. After that, after one year, he ended up having a premium product where companies signed up and he was just crawling the data for these uh, clients. He ended up having 30 machines on premise and, uh, and uh, adapted to the, to the workload he, he knows he needs for the next few years. If you have very flexible workload, I would go for something, something in, the, in the cloud. And I would make sure that, uh, that, uh, that the system is also using the brain. So if you use something like Crate or even Hadoop or Cassandra or whatever, and you run it on VMware that is just virtualized on one host and that is ex or on multiple hosts and exposing that, and you're creating, let's say, for reliability eight instances on two hosts, uh, this does not make, and probably you even have exported some SAN storage or iSCSI from a central storage, this does not make sense. So running a distributed system on, uh, on such an environment, I, uh, I, I don't think this, uh, this is, is like really, really helpful. So be as close to the hardware as possible and try to distribute it. That's, what, that's, my, that's my learning. <clears throat> okay.
Thank you very much. And uh, I'm around there if you, if you have questions and would really love to, to, to hear your feedback and issues on GitHub or in our IRC channel. Uh, yeah, would be happy to, to improve what we're doing. Thank you very much. Thank you.